using the ever-increasing computing power that we have to solve very large-scale scientific problems. Coupling information with action. To explore and interact with our physical world in ways that were never before possible. That is computational science. Heart disease. It's the leading cause of death in the Western world. And the challenge, which still remains, is how to identify patients who are at risk for sudden cardiac death. So in my domain of computational medicine, we build computer models of the heart that simulate how conduction occurs within the heart and how conduction might go wrong. My research in particular focuses on a, a pathway that we believe may be involved in heart failure. Once we think that we have a behavior of the heart described well enough mathematically that we can simulate that behavior on a computer, we then gain confidence that that model is telling us something important about how hearts really behave. That's a hypothesis that we can take into the lab. I do some experiments in the wet lab where I'm able to dynamically monitor the behavior of this particular protein that I'm interested in when it's in cells under different conditions and incorporate all of this into a larger mathematical model so that we can see the effects on the whole cell just from this one particular pathway and we can make predictions that could help us in the early diagnosis and the prevention of disease. That's a true revolution in our study of biology and disease. We're at the point that Isaac Newton was when he was sitting under the apple tree all those hundreds of years ago. Biology is moving from a purely observational to a quantitative science. It's very scary that we know more about the space around our planet than our own oceans. Here at Hopkins, our laboratory is focused on developing navigation and control algorithms for vehicles that are doing research in the field. We do this by using computational sciences to model the dynamics of these underwater systems. With a human-occupied vehicle, you have to get the people back. We want to do autonomous missions, which means is there's no human in the loop. And what I'm doing is I'm developing a supervisory controller, which is basically a pilot for the vehicle, to go and run these missions and then come back to the ship so it can give the data back to the scientists. In the next couple years, we're going to be able to send a vehicle to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. Underwater robotic vehicles, every time they go down, they find at least several new species of animals and plants. You're finding new life and exploring new worlds. There's a noticeable change in EKG right there. You can provide human surgeons with inhuman capabilities. You can transcend human limitations. Surgeons are performing robotic surgeries across the nation, across the world, because it enhances dexterity. You're able to have enhanced visualization. One human limitation is uh, just the precision of your motion, the ability to perform very, very, very delicate motions without hand trimming. And we came up with an idea that we call steady hand manipulation in which a robot and the surgeon both hold on to the surgical instrument. In our initial experiments, uh, we've been using fertilized chicken eggs, which have very small blood vessels about the same size as we have in uh, the retina. And the robot is able to feel when the surgeon pulls on the instrument, and from that can just simply move the tool without any trembling at all in that same direction. Looks pretty good right now, Dave. In the operating room, people's lives are depending on accurate, up-to-date information. But currently, one problem with surgical robotics is that there's a lack of haptic feedback. 
That means that the, the human operator performing the surgery doesn't get any tactile information or any pressure information or any force information. So with force sensors embedded inside the instruments, we're developing this idea of visual overlays. These circles track your instrument as you move around in the operating field, and they change colors to gauge how much force that you're using. Ten years ago, the processing power just wasn't there. Computers have gotten fast enough to do this information fusion in real time to help people in a very direct way. In a sense, we are moving beyond boundaries. We're coming up with ideas that can change reality. And I'm really excited to see where this field is going to go. Really, the sky's the limit.